Here, you can exercise your rights to freedom every day without leaving your home. We don't just say, we do. It's the Stay in City way. I need to watch it. Hello and welcome to Real Talk with myself, Anel M. Dodda, coming to you live on SABC3. Two days away from your television screens, it really feels like a lifetime. And I'm sure you had a better weekend than The Box and Bafana Bafana. Today on the show, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant performed half a century ago. On that night, Professor Christopher Barnard, for the first time, stared into an empty chest and Hamilton Nike actually pulled out the heart. You'll hear from South Africa's first young black female cardiologist and a mother who was told that her daughter would never reach adulthood due to her condition. But right now, what's been happening in your world of entertainment with entertainment news blogger Phil Pella, who I thought was causing havoc on, <laughs> on, on, on social media this weekend. I'm like, Phil, why do I see your name everywhere? But you were, you were educating people. Is yeah, that the right well, word? Yeah. I mean, I was on the show. People loved the interview that we did on Friday. Okay. Um, as well as what was happening with Casper uh, and AKA. I, p I put my opinion out there on that, and that kind of like caught a bit of attention. All as right, well. we'll get to that. First things first, the EMAs yeah. happened last night. What I liked is a lot of South Africans went through. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know Ayana MVP was there. I know uh, Buntle Mudisela yeah. was there. Ludlav was there. Uh, who was nominated from our end? Okay, Nastisi was nominated, okay. uh, uh, as well as Ubebs Wodumo. They were the South Africans that were nominated, nominated for Best uh, African Act. And who won it? Uh, uh, <laughs> the Nigerians took it <laughs> once again. Was there like uh, a voting David. system? Yes, of course. Well, well, we're not going to win that. Thing, <laughs> the Nigerians will take it. Yeah, Davido was, was uh, uh, won that. But, I mean, it was expected. He had an amazing year with uh, if. Do you know what it is? Yeah. I mean, if you can go to South Africa and you're singing the same song, mm -hmm. then you go to Nigeria, we're singing the same song. Yeah. Then you go to America and they are also singing the same song. He's, he's an, he's, he is no, international. No, but, I mean, generally, I mean, I always say to people that South Africans, they go to London yeah. and they lose their twang, they lose their accent, they get a twang and, and they don't listen to South African music. A Nigerian anywhere in the world still listens to Nigerian music. Uh. Do you understand? So the reach of Nigerian entertainment is beyond just the continent of Africa. Africa, it's yeah. everywhere. So if you're having a voting kind of system, you know that all the Nigerians everywhere in the world yeah. are voting for that person. Dude, and you know what? Nigerians can travel. I went to Thailand and mm -hmm. they were Nigerians. I was like, these guys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm all for them because, like, they don't constrict themselves to no. look like Nigeria. No. But also, besides that, Davido is incredibly talented yeah. and he puts a lot of work into his, his, his music. Yeah. And he comes from a rich family. Yeah, and 30 billion was a huge song. Let's not forget that mm. it was a huge song all over. I mean, like, that's the song that defined 2016, 2017 for a lot of uh, Africans. Okay, uh, yeah. sports awards happened yesterday at Emperor's Palace. Uh, Luvo, big awards. Yeah, Luvo won the Sportsman of the Year, and I think he also won the, won the uh, Sports Star of the Year as well. Uh, Casta uh, Semenya won two, yeah. uh, Sportswoman of the Year, and the, um, I think it's called the Popular Choice one. Yeah. Yeah, so huge night for the uh, both of them. They, they both walked away with cars. Which really? Was, yes. <laughs> oh my word, Luvo won a car. I'm yes. so happy for him, because um, you know what? I yeah. feel like... He's the world champion. Yes. In the world right now, yeah. no one jumps further than him in yeah. long jump. And the sponsors just aren't coming through. I don't get that. Yeah, but what was great is that I didn't know his story. When, when, when he, f he won the first award, he, he talked drugs. about why he was, he was a drug addict yeah. and now look at him now. And when he, went, when he went on stage to take the second trophy and he did that jump, I mean, it was just amazing. No, <laughs> I'm so happy for him. And yeah. he has a line, he says, <laughs> which means I play in sand and then the money gets, the money gets into the, the bank. bank. And yeah. he's right. I'm so happy for him. And also because he doesn't enjoy the same PR that the other sports stars do. Yeah. But also, Casta, Casta, top of a game. You can't... I, I mean, it's Casta. I mean, it, like, it would have not been an award show had she not <laughs> won anything, you know? And, and was she out there rocking the fashion as well? Her and her wife, like... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, they were there. I mean, I, I, I tweeted a picture of them on the red carpet doing the hard thing. It was just so sweet. Uh, you know, yeah, but they, it's Casta. Are there money prizes for that, for the other people who went besides the cars? Um, not really, except for the main, the main ones, like yeah. your, 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 your sportswoman, yeah. and um, what's the other one? Um, 
uh, an athlete with a disability as well. Oh, I think okay. there's okay. a bit of remuneration that happens with that. But that's what happens when Figil and Balula moves for four years. I know. He takes the budget with Yes, him. they had a cash bar. I was not happy. <laughs> 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 okay, let's wrap it up. Uh, huge um, waves happening on social media yeah. with uh, fill up FNB. Hashtag yeah. just buy a ticket, bro. Mm -hmm. Please explain <laughs> to everyone what okay, happened so there. So this is what happened. Um, AKA decided to jump onto the Casper, you know, you know, hype and said that um, I want to do fill up with TV. Come on, TV. <laughs> That's Casper your best. Oh, he calls Casper TV. What's the yes. <laughs> Is it an insult? Yeah, sort of like, you know, know it all. Kinda. Oh, wow. <laughs> or whatever. It's time we put this ooh, to bed. It's 2017, guys. Okay. And did he carry on? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, he said something about wanting a million to, to come and perform and all of that. And my thing on that is, you know what? This guy is smart, and people don't want to believe that. AKA is smart. AKA, when it comes to PR and using social media yeah. to benefit himself, he is a pro at that, and you can't take that away yeah. from him. And for me, I don't know how genuine this is, but I, feel, I still feel like he was putting himself into the Casper, you know, narrative, yeah. which is going to be what everybody's going to be talking about for the next five months or six months. To understand. So are you not are you thinking that his 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 offer wasn't genuine? Because I've always thought of that that yeah. they should do a show together. Look, um, uh, obviously I can't say 100%ly it wasn't, but yeah. come on, uh, this is AKA. We know the guy loves PR <laughs> and <laughs> stunts. He's and like, you guys have forgotten <laughs> about me. <laughs> yes. Let me remind you, uh, exactly. I am here. Yeah. Think about it. From now on, up until the 2nd of December, yeah. and beyond that, everybody's going to be talking about Casper, whether he fills that up or not. But let's not act like, you know, the fact that other people came through and said, yeah. hey, I back you, hey, I back you, mm. hey, I'm buying tickets, hey, I'm doing this was not also caused by AKA's tweets because people are like, do I look as Exactly. So, that so he can't it benefits do it both of them. So it benefits both of exactly. them, I believe. Do you know what I mean? but, and you know, I'm glad that you mentioned that because had he done that, had he said, which is what I tweeted, had he just said, well, I'm supporting you, let's put whatever it is that we have yeah. between us aside, guess what, I'm going to buy hundreds of your tickets and give it to my fans to come and be part of that 72. No. Wonderful. But he didn't do that. Yeah. Instead, he made it about himself yeah you know whereas everybody else is buying though they are motivated by his action yeah. are buying tickets for their fans because to be fair casper uh, insanely talented yeah and i mean would have been great anyway but he does have the taylor swift phenomenon behind mm. him where we didn't really taylor swift didn't have an army until kanye west took her on yes right and with casper the healthy rivalry uh, with i mean slaps were, were, were thrown apart and, and all of that but the rivalry between him and aka i think benefits both of them no it does but but let's let's be fair i think i think i think casper has proven himself to be a viable brand and an audience puller and oh, a ticket totally. seller because of the dome i think doing the dome for yeah. him was that thing of saying this is the catalyst of what a south african celebrity yeah. and south african brand power in terms of celebrities can be yeah. so the rivalry thing yeah it was great for getting them into the media but in terms of people actually buying uh, yeah. into the Casper brand and yeah. actually paying for the Casper brand. I think the Dome did that for him, not AK. But also, Casper also had older people listening to him. Yeah. Our parents don't care about the beef. Beef, no rocks, <laughs> king, ew. They just like the fact yeah. that Casper, is, the, his music is tangible for everyone. No, um, and like I said on Friday, I think our... As South Africans, we're getting to a point where now we redefine what a celebrity yeah. is for us. Yeah. We're no longer taking the Hollywood thing on, on board as much. Yeah. So Casper represent a South African narrative for what a celebrity is, you know, yeah. from the bottom yeah. up, you know, yeah. still has a bit of yeah. humility in there, whereas the other one uh, represents the bling. Okay, <laughs> so the, I'm, I'm going to sell my cars. Yeah. Um, do, what do you think about that? Doesn't that doesn't work anymore. That, that <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Do you think he's really going to sell his cars? Or is, that, just, is, is that working at our heartstrings? Of course not. Of course he's not going to do that. I think, I think for him it was a matter of, look, uh, you should know this. We work in an industry where sometimes we don't want to be honest about it, but sometimes a bit of sympathy from other people <laughs> benefits us. Favor. You know, and I'm going to make you feel guilty about supporting me. Uh, is Casper going to fill up f and um, Yeah, I think he will. I Good. think it will. I, mean, I, also I, I, might, so. I might not be the exact, like, you know, 72,000, whatever, yeah. but I think he will uh, surpass 60,000. We'll be there in yeah. our numbers, uh, singing along. Casper, uh, go do your thing. That's it from the entertainment world. Thank you so much to Phil uh, for coming through to give us the backstory and the roundup of what happened in entertainment over the weekend. You can follow him and all his spice uh, on his entertainment blog. It's www.philmpelablog.com or grab him on Twitter, it's at Phil Mbella. After the break, we celebrate heart transplant innovations and you will meet South Africa's first young black female cardiologist. Come back to us.
I was instructed uh, to look after the donor, Denise Darvel. I was the same age as Denise Darvel when we did the transplant. But she was brain dead. And um, once the two doctors have certified that this was the case, uh, she was classified as a potential donor and her father gave permission to, uh, for her to be a donor. But Louis was quite amazing to take a chance. He was actually the right candidate. Coincidence, perhaps, I don't know. That, that dreadful accident. And he, he was there, you know. It's quite amazing. When Dini and I went to fetch the, the heart-lung machine, we had to go through the doctor's change rooms. And when we got to the second change room, Professor Barnard was sitting in the change room, in a chair, and we stopped because we didn't know whether we could go through. And he said, no, you can go through. And he said in his book that at that moment when he was sitting there, he was contemplating whether he should go ahead with the operation or not. And when he saw Dini and myself being so determined to get the heart-lung machine, he went into shower and he thought he will do the operation. Fifty years ago, one of the most memorable events in the history of humankind took place under the bright lights of an operating theatre at Khutiski Hospital in Cape Town. It was that night Professor Chris Barnard stared into an empty chest, something he had never done in his life before. Dr. Barnard and Hamilton Nagy would be the pioneers of the first human heart transplant. Since then, there have been numerous heart transplants and many success stories. And now... We find out how a young woman from the rural village of Mpindu in Eman Freya, ridiculed for not speaking proper English, told by teachers that she would never amount to anything. And look now, she's out here being the first young black cardiologist in the country. She's here to tell her story. We welcome the good doctor, Viwem Dwesi. Hello. Hello there. Hi, 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 hi. Yes, clap for her. Also, I'm so glad you have a weave and you're smart because there's this notion amongst men that chicks with weaves is like, they, oh. you know, they've just got nothing going for them. They want people to buy them things and you're like, yeah, look no. at me now. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm buy a doctor. Yes. So uh, how do you go from, you know, Mpindweni, right? Yeah. Mount Freya. Mm. So then you move to Mtata. Yes. With your family. Yes. And it's jarring, I, I know, to be, go from the rural areas into a town and mm. you just like... <gasps> Yeah, yeah, that was a part of, you know, it was a very difficult time in my life, but uh. I had to understand that um, it's something that I had to go through. To start with, my own teachers, where I came from, could not express themselves in English. So I only learned English when I got home, because my grandfather was a teacher. Uh. So when I got home, he made me read, and he would go through my homeworks and tell me how stupid my teachers were. Yes, so he constantly told me that. And at the time, obviously, I would be, you know, amongst the first people in the class. Yeah. Position one, position two, and every time he would tell me, you are number one because they are all stupid. You are not number one. You are not number one. Oof. If you are to meet people who are really clever, you're not going to be number one. You are number one because he or he or she doesn't know what she's talking about. Mm. So he, my grandfather really was inspiring and he loved education. So he gave up everything so that we could be educated. Yeah. And he had six kids and they all went to school. They all made names for themselves. So for me to become a doctor, it was not, nothing special at home. It was expected It was you. expected of me. So Did he always know that you'd be a doctor or did he just know that no, you'd be educated? No, no, actually no. I wanted to be an engineer because uh. my brother is an engineer. So I was like, I want to be like him. Uh. But I wasn't good in mathematics, so I couldn't go get into engineering. So I ended up doing medicine. Wait, wait, somebody lied to me. Wait. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to be good at maths to be a doctor? Well, good means you have to have an A. Well, not all, not everybody who gets into engineering We were told maths and science. I could be a doctor right now. <laughs> Well, me not being good meant that I got a B for maths. Okay. It wasn't an A. Mm. So if it's not an A, it's not good enough. And did you study medicine at the University of Transkei? Yes. Which is now called which is Nelson Mandela Walter University. Walter Sisulu. Walter Sisulu. Walter Sisulu. Okay. Yeah, I was quite, you know, sure of what I wanted to do. Um, my mother works in the hospital. She's a food service manager. So she used to come back home and tell me how horrible doctors are treated. So then she tried to discourage me from doing medicine. And well, that's a first. 
Yes. Don't no, be a she, doctor, my child. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so then, um, unfortunately, when I didn't get accepted in UCT to do engineering, I had no other option because I was sure that I was going to get accepted. Oh. But unfortunately, I didn't get accepted, so I just took a walk to the university, ended up doing medicine. So what does it mean, are you the youngest, are you the youngest black cardiologist? I'm the ever? youngest overall. Yes, because this whole black thing they keep throwing in. No, it was, the black... It was actually my first question, I wanted to ask, what does... No, 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 no. You're I'm, the youngest cardiologist the... the country's ever seen? Yes. <gasps> Girl, hey, okay. hey, hey. Yeah. Okay, so did you study for 14 years? So, yeah, uh, well, let's do the count. I've never counted, actually. Well, you and I are both terrible yeah. in math, so <laughs> I'm scared for us to count, but let's go. Yeah, I know. So I did medicine. I was lucky because I only did medicine for five years. Okay. And then after that, I did internship for two years. Uh -huh. And then I did Comse for a year. And then I specialized to be a physician for four years. Uh -huh. And then I did cardiology for three years. And then now I'm going to do electrophysiology for another two years. That's and then 17 years, babe. Yes. That's <laughs> 17. Is the pay good? Um, look. Because if you're going to make me study for 17 years. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> not, actually. Uh, when you look at how much work you put in, because you lose your social life to start with, and you lose, you lose so many things because mm. you're always at work. So you need people around you who understand that you are not available most times. But um, once you get to a point that I'm in now, it's up to me if I want money. Unfortunately, medicine is not one of those things where you work from home. I have mm. to be there for me to make money. It requires It you. requires to be there. Yeah. So I had to make a decision of saying, look, I want quality of life. And therefore, it's fine. I'll sacrifice. I'll sell my car. I'll sell my house, move to the States and study for two more years. Okay. When I come back, at least I'll work between eight and four o'clock okay. and I won't work weekends. So basically, more than anything, the choice that I've made now, it's a lifestyle choice. I see my, the people that I've graduated with now, I mean, they already are driving Porsche and that and that, and they live in nice estates. But I had to make an informed decision of saying, look, mm. I want quality of life. I want to enjoy my life. And for me to do that, I have to take a chilled you know, mm. path. So you said the people around you need to understand what it is that you do. Apparently, your family sometimes used to go with you to an exam. Bruh, like every <laughs> exam. Like how? Like sit in the room with you no, and be no, like... No, not sit in the room. <laughs> not sit in the room. They don't sit in the room. Uh, they usually sit outside. They will come with me, be outside, give me water, pray. Oh. I come from a praying family and I pray myself. So I come from a very, you know, Christian yeah. religion, religious Founded family. Founded in Christ, yes, right? Yes, definitely. I love Christ and Jesus with all my heart. And um, so they come with me, they take leave. My mom takes leave, oh. my brother takes leave, and they sit outside the exam room. Because you know what? I yeah. find the whole support of parents thing there, it's so stressed when it comes to sports stars like yeah. and the examples are there you know yeah. look at tiger woods and his yeah. dad yeah. look at beyonce yeah. and them with entertainment yeah. look at serena and yeah. the dad he yeah. was there he was there he was there but no one ever speaks about how yes. that support it's academically it's is also very critical important. it's very important i think if i didn't have that support from family it's not just my mother and my brother my extended family as well yeah. my aunts everybody it's the same thing um for me, for example, I was so discouraged by teachers from primary school to high school. I went to a Catholic school, a Holy Cross. A Holy Cross. And there, if you don't have a, a prominent surname, you are nothing. But that's some tata for you. Yes. It's like not if just you Holy don't, Cross, it's the yes, entire city. If you don't have a prominent mm. surname or you don't have a twang or you ride a taxi or to school. Or your family doesn't own a shop. Yes. Then you are stupid, basically. Yeah. So I got constantly told of how stupid I was. And if it hadn't been for the support I had at home, I would have given up. But when I got home, I was like the brightest child. Mm, and celebrated. I must say, though, that my cousins and my brother, they're all very sharp. So I was the one who's always been, you know, slower than, yeah. the, slower than the rest. But what kept me going is knowing that my mom, my aunts, everyone else believes in my capabilities. So I just pushed through that. And more than anything, I know my, I have an identity in Christ, and if Christ says I'm the best, then I am the best. Look, go.
So from being ridiculed for not being smart enough to being on Nelson Mandela's medical team in his last days, uh huh, to being South Africa's first young black, uh, nah, remove black, first young female cardiologist, uh, it's not, if that's not Sledge, I sincerely do not know what is. Dr. VM Tuesday is not going anywhere. She'll be back later on in the show. After the break, you'll get to meet a dynamic young woman who is a heart failure survivor and has recently had a heart transplant. You wanna watch this, stay with us. Anna's Kluter was born with a heart condition and doctors said she would never reach adulthood. But thanks to innovation in the medical field, Candace was able to get a heart transplant and has been living for 18 months with a new heart. What does your teacher say? I survived a heart transplant. Yes. <laughs> so do some people not survive a heart transplant? Is that, are those like the risk you're told going in? Yes, yes. No, I mean, most of us don't really survive. So there's quite, quite a challenge to get. And also you've got to take your medication regularly, exactly what the doctor wants you to and that. Okay, That's so 18 months. Uh, with your new heart, yes. what's the biggest change that has happened for you? Wow, um, a lot. Because, um, you know, especially before the transplant, be being born with a heart condition, yeah. it's quite, it's quite diffi uh, diff um, difficult and things like that. So now we, um, and then as I got older, I got worse and worse. And then, um, then I, started, I started swelling, I started having joint pain. Um, I started getting out of breath, so I was actually being put on oxygen as well. Yeah. And then, um, and yeah, and then afterwards we then when, when we got the phone call, which was quite an awesome feeling. And then after we got the phone call, that l changed everything. And then that I don't have. We've don't got a heart for you. Yes, it was amazing. You know, then I don't. I'm not on oxygen anymore, which is also a nice thing. Yeah. I can actually walk around the shops. Right. Be before I could only walk in, you know, in the wheelchair, go in the wheelchair, things like that. So it was actually quite a, a change, a big very big change <laughs> so your 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 body before the heart transplant yes. was often 80 year old basically you can put it in that direction yes and then now you basically reversed and you you have like the body of a, of a teenager yes so surely there's things that 80 year olds are not doing <laughs> that you wanted to do yes. as a teenager but your teenage years were spent you know not going out not yes. going to parties not yes. playing sport so what like what was the first thing you were like i didn't do this as a kid i'm in my 35 um, years on God's green earth, I'm gonna do it now. <laughs> Walking down the road. <laughs> Walking down the road for the first time. And also, mom even took a lot of pictures from me just walking down the road. <laughs> And also walking on the treadmill, I was oh. actually able to walk on the treadmill, which is quite nice, and join the, starting to join the gym classes as well. Uh. So that was, yeah. So actually, and then also um, walk around the shops, that was yeah. also a very, very big thing, you know. Don't Such get tired little things that we take <laughs> yes. for granted, but they were just amazing luxuries for you. Yes. So, you know, when people are insulting each other, they're like, oh, that one's, that one's got a black heart, such a dark heart. So when you were told that you're getting a heart transplant, yes. Did it not like cross your mind that, oh, I hope the person who's giving me a heart is kind because I really don't <laughs> want to be a, a nasty person? Actually not, no. <laughs> really, you were like, I don't care, give me a heart. I just wanted a heart because, you know, you're kind of down at that point. So, yeah. you're, not, uh, so you're just you're sort of very, very grateful for the heart, wherever, wherever it comes from. Yeah. So it's quite, yeah. Do you get to meet the family? No. Not at all. No. In, in South Africa, we're not allowed to. They're very strict with us. You know, also with um, from the donor side as well, it's very unfair for, mm. for them and very unfair for us as a recipient. Um, also for emotional as well. Yeah. So we don't, they don't actually, um, we don't, we allow to write a letter. To say thank to you. To say thank you, oh. yes. And that's the only thing, but otherwise they, um, but we don't, yeah, otherwise they don't. And yeah. you don't feel like there's something out of place in your body that there's another organ, you know, that belonged to somebody um, else that's now with you. No, not at all, not at all, mm. no. It's actually that still a thing to get used to knowing, okay, you've got a normal heart, mm. but it's um, not really, no, mm. no. What's the process like from when you get the call yes. that says, um, you know, you were on the list and now you're literally next, we found a match. What's yes. the process? Do you go on meds immediately? Do you go into the hospital? But I mean, you said you were bedridden already. Yes, so, so what, what's yes. the process then? Okay, what actually happened is I was at home and um, now having all this thing, then what happened is they, they, phone, they, t they send you home. So you could actually spend some time with your family if you, if you made it. If you make it, they phone you. 
and they would they were the call the transplant coordinator at the hospital phones you and says listen we've got your organ for you you can come in then they then you got a four hour um a four hour um window that yeah. they got to get the heart into from from the recipient or from the donor it's that, into quick. The, that quick it has to be very very quick from the from the um, recipient into the donor that's how quick it has to be it has to be four hours otherwise the organs start failing Oh, and there's no ways in which they can keep the heart in a machine, you know, they, pumping. Yeah, I think they start, they're starting to do something like that. I'm not 100% sure of yeah. that. But, um, but we will, um, but, you know, they, they, you know they, when I got the heart, they actually put it in a cooler box. And they keep it still. And they keep it on ice. Yeah. And then they move it. They actually have lifted it to um, where I was. And then they put it in. So it was quite quick. Okay, then uh, you're there. They open you up, they take your heart out, yes. and then they put the other heart in. Yes. So there's a moment in life where you had no heart in yes. your body. Yes. I was on life support at that point to keep everything going. <laughs> okay, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then the recovery, because, you know, it's been 18 months. Yes. Walk us through that 18 months. I mean, now, mm. perfect. You're mm. here, you're breathing, mm. you walked up the stairs by yourself. Yes. But what's the recovery period like from sure. when you wake up? Um, when you wake up, you know, especially now you're on a lot of drugs and that. So, I mean, uh, most of the time you, <laughs> you, um, you're thinking that you are the people. God. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I was fighting. I was a big fighter. Okay. And, um, and then, so you, I was in ICU for three weeks. and you then almost lost your leg. Yes. Hard, okay, explain how hard leg. Um, I, oh, I, uh, You're not a doctor. No, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Don't worry, there's a doctor in the house. Yeah, we'll ask I'll her in the last her. segment. Ask She's her. coming yes. back. It's the first thing we'll ask her. Please remind me. <laughs> okay, so you wake up and you dear my car and you drugged up. Um, and then afterwards we actually, um, um, yeah, then afterwards I yeah, wake, wake up and everything like yeah. that. And then, then they start getting you to walk. Yeah, they had to get you, you could start it sitting up, which was quite nice. And then the, you, um, now you're so swollen eh, at that yeah. point, you're like really bad. And then afterwards you, so you keep, um, then after they, um, after, yeah, it was quite a, quite a while, they started getting you to sit in a chair yeah. for 10 minutes and five minutes and 15 minutes and 20 minutes. Are they, are they, are they aware of like, what are, what are the dangers? Like you could clot up. Yes, okay. that's right, yes. Uh, Oh, Grey's Anatomy, help me. <laughs> there we go. Danny <laughs> Duquette, here we are. Okay, so those are the things that they're looking out for. So yes. how quickly can you go home if they have to monitor you in that, in that, in that regard? That's, I'm not actually quite sure. And I'll have to ask the doctor okay. as well for that. I'm not sure. But I was, because, you know, each person recovers differently. True. And also with um, different conditions that, you know, each person has gone through as well and yeah. how they react towards the medication okay. and how they react towards the surgery. So it's it's quite it's quite difficult. So each person is yeah. a certain amount, you know. That each one's special. Yeah. I get it. Yes, sure. you are not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. So it could have not been easy raising a child with a heart condition, right? When we return, Candice is here, but her mom Wendy joins us to tell us the story from her perspective, from when she gave birth. Come back. believe that it was a great exciting day for me, full of tension. It was not such a big deal. It was another heart operation. The only time that I realized that I was doing something different, and this was really the moment of truth, is when I looked down into the chest of that patient and there was no heart. I'd seen many open chests, but I've always seen a heart there. And this is the first time that I saw a living human being without a heart. Uh, if you have just tuned in, we're talking about heart transplants and just heard from a heart transplant recipient, Candice Klutzer. 35 years ago, mother Wendy Eno gave birth to a little girl with a heart condition. It was so severe, the situation she was in, that she was not breathing and had turned dark blue in color. Doctors told her that she would never reach adulthood. Wendy Eno is here to share her journey. Am I saying your surname right, or should I say it like the, the thing Eno, that... Exactly Eno, like you like... There we go, the same. The thing with take to burp. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Eno. There we go. So, I want to take you back 35 years ago, right? Right. And you give birth. When you were pregnant, were, you, were there any signs? Were you told that, listen, your child may be born with a heart condition? Uh, just prepare yourself? Not at all. It was... Um, maybe ignorance um i just went to my normal gp 
And um, no, there was absolutely no, no sign mm. that my baby was any different to when, only when she was born. So she's born and, yes. you know, she's not breathing. Well, the thing is that they were acting a bit stupid around me because they didn't want me to see the baby. Uh -huh. uh, they, the doctor was making funny remarks and I couldn't actually understand. I didn't know what was going on. I was young and I really didn't understand what was going on. And they were trying to get to resuscitate her. She actually stopped breathing for six minutes and um, they said to us that she's going to be brain damaged, uh -huh. that she would never become an adult and... Um, we must just go home, you know, that's, that's, this is our lot, mm. which was a huge shock. And um, then my husband, she had to go to a better hospital the, the same day she was born. Yeah. She was rushed by ambulance to um, another hospital. So you stay in this hospital, your I husband, had to. this is the baby. Correct. <gasps> your heart. Well, oh. you see, they had to get, so I had lots of stitches and I was very uncomfortable. So unfortunately, yeah. I just stayed behind. And then my husband took her to the next hospital where we hadn't decided quite on a name yet, but he had to book her in. So he chose the name Candace because <laughs> he got carte blanche on that. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute, had you even discussed it like before and like maybe we'll go with Lolita? Well, there we go. <laughs> we had, and I had another name, but he Which put her is? Uh, Erin. <laughs> Hello, Erin, how are you doing? <laughs> That's what we're calling you from now on, okay? Mom gets drunk card. So how many times have you heard the story? Quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> Does it change at all? Does it like... <laughs> no, it's the same one every single time. When was, do you remember the first time you heard it? Because obviously, as a child, you have to be told, um, Candace, Erin, you are... <laughs> <laughs> you are not like other children and you have to you, you have to listen but you also have to take it seriously because this is your life yes so when was the yeah. first time you remember being sat down to, to be explained what your life is like yeah it's actually a great question um i think i've always been knowing what's going you know what yeah. um, i think my parents always brought me up that you know this is what it is you know and they've right. actually always shouted me and been careful and things like that so i think yeah always since i've since I was young, I knew. Wendy, was there ever a time when you didn't have a slight panic when she has to leave the house and, you know, she's... All the time. Nah. All the time. <laughs> the thing is, I wanted to protect her. I wanted to um, shield her because um, it's, it's, it's your mother's instinct. Yeah, because you don't know... I mean, like, my child has got no health issues, but when he's yeah. not around me, like, there's, there's a... You, your heart's walking around, you know, and you, you, you can't control it. So yes. when, when she went to school, like, is, did you have to go to schools where you tell the teachers, guys, this is the situation, please, let's not mess around here? They did, know. Look, at that stage, her heart wasn't, her heart condition wasn't so severe. Yeah. She could function without, um, you know, relatively uh, easily, without, I mean, she couldn't partake in sport. Mm. She couldn't um, do swimming. She couldn't ride a bicycle. You know, the, the, the extra story she couldn't do, but she could actually, you know, attend the classes and she used mm. to go to school with a bus, school bus and whatever. Mm. But as she got older, that is when, um, at the age of 15, she actually had open heart surgery to try and uh, do something repair. But all they actually did was a bit of plumbing work because they actually couldn't do much, mm. you know. How do you date? How do you like... That date? was a very good challenge. Yeah. I was actually married. And, yes. um, and then afterwards, you know, the, he... <laughs> My ex-husband just abandoned me at the hospital the one time when I was having seizures. He said, I just abandoned me and said, okay, sorry, I can't handle you anymore. And he left me there in the ward and he walked out. And I had to divorce him afterwards. So it was quite rough. But wait a minute. He was aware yes. of yes. the situation. Yes. Like, it's not like he no. tripped and was married. Exactly. Like, he was aware of the situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Five years before they, they yeah. actually dated and then were married for three. So he knew exactly, but he decided that it was he too much. He just couldn't handle it. And yeah, for you, you must have a lifetime of taking things personally on behalf of your child, right? Well, you know, it's funny yeah. how you actually learn to um, take it day by day. It's, it's, it's strange, but it, at, at one stage when we weren't sure she was going to get the heart, when she was so severe, we didn't know if she was going to get And we actually went through a stage of being very cross, very angry. Well, I certainly was very mm -hmm. angry, very cross. Mm -hmm. And I actually went for counselling. And they said it's the different stages that you're going through. And then eventually you make peace with it. And then you live it one day at a time. 
if I used to wake up in the morning and I used to say, morning, Kent, and if she used to grunt from the bedroom, then I know she's still alive. Yeah, you shall be good to go today. And that's as simple as that, and then you took it on day by day. Mm. But you didn't look at the bigger picture because it's too scary. And you didn't know what actually was going to happen. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, you didn't look at the big, the no, bigger picture. No, no, it's, it's too, too big, too scary. Did you ever have a day where you were like, okay, this is it? Often. Really? The one time I, um, Elizabeth, who looked after Candace, um, she phoned and said she's fallen, she's collapsed, and I had to rush home from work, and she cracked her ankle because she was actually bedridden. She couldn't even get into a bath. We couldn't even, we had to bed bath her. Mm. So, I mean, um, she was totally, it was every day was a, a hardship. It, mm. was, it was difficult. Every day was a challenge for us. Okay, so now it's 35 years, right? Yes. And Th no, 33. It's 33 years. Yes. Okay, so you now, like, obviously the, the leash is not long. Not at all. For, for old candy over here. <laughs> and now she's fine, right? So you have to, like, release, like, the oh, rope a, a, a little bit, <laughs> okay? How's that process for you? Um, I'm actually trying to push her to do things that... Um, She's a teenager. She's 16 years old. Sorry, I thought you meant 33 before the heart, yeah. but now after, sorry, yeah. 35 years. I um, actually wanted to go out and I'll push her. She's actually very active in the church now. Uh -huh. She's doing this, helping with the sound. She's, um, go, she's going out with her friends. She's, she's um, started doing a little bit of gym. She started, but you, the thing is that people don't realize she never had a normal childhood. So when yeah. they gave her the heart and they said, go for it, she doesn't know what that means. Yeah. She's never had a normal heart. Mm. So it, you can't say to her, okay, cool. You've, you've got, got now, uh, go do whatever. Uh, you're like, I never did it. I don't know what you're talking about. Precisely. So <laughs> she actually had to learn and mm. she's still learning. She's, she's, a, she's still a baby in with a new heart. I mean, it's got this fantastic opportunity yeah. this miracle that happened i mean it's our lotto everybody says they'll never win the lotto well guess like, what we yeah. won the lotto <laughs> won. we won Listen. i don't want anything else in my whole life i don't need anything else in my life look with a mom with as much heart as you it was it, it was only going to happen that she was going to get the heart and be sitting here today so <laughs> thank you so much for your love and support for her really like i just I, there's life in your eyes and I, <laughs> I i i love you already okay i do listen talk about resilience perseverance uh, those are just the ingredients that got wendy eno through the tough years raising a young girl with a heart condition that nearly took her life several times we say goodbye to wendy now but after the break we welcome back dr vm Dressy to talk to us more about heart transplants and the innovations in the field as we celebrate 50 50 years of the night that Dr. Christian Barnard stared into an empty chest. If you have any questions for her, your WhatsApp voice notes are welcome. Send them off right now. Dr. Christian Barnard and Hamilton Nike's first human heart transplant is a world-renowned topic that has led to many breakthroughs within the medical field. However, the Organ Donor Foundation says that as South Africa celebrates 50 years since the first heart transplant, there's been a dramatic drop in heart donations. The foundation says despite making a history in performing the first heart transplant, South Africa has seen a 40% decline in the number of heart transplants done. The annual South African Heart Congress, which focused on the fundamentals to innovation, wrapped up yesterday. And joining myself, Candice, is Dr. Vuem Dwesi again, uh, who, you attended the conference, eh? I Can banned the conference. Oh, don't <laughs> tell nobody, just be like, just like, I got my t-shirt. <laughs> She's like, I got my t-shirt and I was out of there. Yeah. Okay, so 40% decline, that yeah. is, that is, I yeah. mean, shouldn't it be the other way around yeah, as, you know, the, the, the superstitions and the stigma around organ donor. Yeah, you'd think that South Africans are getting more educated now uh. and the word is out there, but unfortunately it's not. Because if, even if people feel like, or they think they're organ donors, if they haven't signed, unfortunately there's really nothing we can do. Yeah. So that's why it's important for some, for people to make sure that they sign and they keep that form that they have signed in their ID books or with next to their medical aid cards. Mm -hmm. Because if you are involved in a car accident and you get to the hospital, if we don't know or you're not on the system for organ you donation, not so you can't. We can't just take your heart without your permission. Is, is there like a, a soliciting 
I, I know soliciting sounds terrible, like saying, give us your heart. But <laughs> for, like, no, for instance, no one's ever spoken to me about organ donation, ever. Not any doctor, not any person at a mall carrying a clipboard, no one. So no. Uh, uh, like, how are we supposed to educate people on it when no one is speaking about it? Okay. I would say uh, the downfall of the medical field or system in South Africa is that we're not out there in the social medias and you're too busy. Or, yeah, we're too busy. Lives. We're too busy for that. <laughs> but at the same time, it's very unfortunate that so many people die, and yet I can, uh, I can, you know, bet that people do want to donate. Yeah. But like you were saying, yeah. they don't know how to. Mm -hmm. So if you go to your GP, they're supposed to have forms where you're supposed to sign, and then they give. I mean. A, any given point in your life is supposed to be, you know, going to see a doctor. So what, what on you will say? Is it still that, like, that little necklace that says I'm an organ donor? Well, you can have the necklace, but the form, it's important for you to have your form in your wallet or next to your medical aid. Just like you drive around with your medical aid okay. card. It should be there with your medical aid card. Okay. So you were saying something during the break about how it's important to look out you know, for symptoms because, yes. you know, yes, you had your condition from a very young age, mm -hmm. so you grew up with it, but people can develop the symptoms along the way. Yeah. So what, what were you saying there? Okay, with, from my side, with my, the symptoms that I had, it was uh, a lot of swelling. Yeah. Um, my joints were very stiff. Yeah. I got tired quite quickly and out of breath, so I was on oxygen quite a, for the 22 months while I was waiting. So the, that's actually quite, you know, and also... Um, that, and then obviously, you know, when you've got to look after yourself when you've got the heart failure as well by, mm. you know, obviously taking your medication exactly how they described it. Because mm. that's really, really important as well. If from right there with, the, with yeah. that. So the swelling, where, where is that coming from? Okay. So the heart has four chambers, right? Yeah. So, and the right side takes blood from your low extremities and the different parts of your body back to the heart. So then when you start getting heart failure, if the right side of the heart is not functioning properly, yeah. or even the left side of the heart is not functioning properly, that fluid that's supposed to go back to the heart is unable to do so, mm. and then you get the swelling. So it's just a balance of pressures. Like if you, you know, if you put something on a flat surface, or if I put something here, mm. and obviously if the pressure is more this side, it then will it, will yeah. it will tilt. So it's the same thing with the heart. If the part of the chambers of the heart is, um, has a lower pressure, therefore the fluid will not be able to go back, and then they get swelling. And unfortunately for some patients, they don't, you know, get your symptoms, like where they get uh, swelling, poor, it's just so poor. So they never effort. know. They mm -hmm. never know, especially with people who use drugs, your illicit drugs, you like cocaine mm. and other things, they go into acute heart failure. Or people who have uh, hypertension and the hypertension is not controlled, sometimes they don't have the swelling. They just go into heart failure. And the only way you would see is when they are unable to breathe and they have poor effort tolerance. Does every heart condition require a heart transplant? No. Okay. No. So they There's different, like we work with cardiothoracic surgeons who are the people who actually do their heart transplantation, yeah. but we are cardiologists, so we tell them, okay, this one needs heart transplant, this one, we can work with medication. So we first try out medication, we give them medication. If the medication doesn't work, there's also devices that we have, so we try the devices out. Mm. So if you're on medication, optimal medical therapy, mm. and you're not treated by a GP, obviously, yeah. or just a physician, you're treated by a specialist cardiologist, supposed to be a team effort. So that team will have a cardiologist, will have a pulmonologist, will have a cardiothoracic oh. surgeon. So then when you get to a point where we have as a heart team, seen that, okay, we've given this patient everything that we could in terms of guidelines. We, I mean, we have guidelines. You can't just treat yeah, according to yeah. what you feel like. So in terms of guidelines, we've treated with medication. And if the patient is a patient that, a good, that is a good candidate for device therapy, then we try device therapy. Oh, that's when they put like the little like instruments like in, yes. into your... Yeah, into your, your CRT, pacemaker yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. Did you so ever go have, have those? No, um, they were going to, but then um, I got the heart. Okay. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's so unfortunate that in the public sector we unfortunately don't have... There's only one centre that does heart transplants, which is in Cape Town. So our patient, for example, in the Gauteng province, I mean... I've had in the time that I've spent in cardiology, I haven't had even one patient being transplanted. So if you don't have a medical aid, unfortunately, the mm -hmm. system, it takes forever for you to get there. You can imagine 
Cape Town has to take care of their Western Cape population. So if you're outside Cape Town, sorry. Wow, okay, so we've got a voice note. Uh, have a listen to this. Um, hey, Anele. I just wanted to ask, is it possible for a person to actually donate a heart that has been donated to them to another person? Okay, so let me paint your picture. Uh, so I get, I get a call, like Candace did, saying, Anele, you've got a heart. And then I decide, actually, it's fine. I want you to have my heart. And then I say, give my heart to Uvi. But how would you know? There's a list. Mm -hmm. On that list, it's a confidential list that okay. is only known by the team. And oh. those are the people, even me as a doctor, I wouldn't know if, okay, we do have a list, a local list in yeah. my hospital, yeah. for example. But the people who do the operations, for example, I'm not in Khudoskia, I'd never know, or in Mill Park, I wouldn't know when my patient is going to be transplanted. Mm. So th then it's very difficult for you to know that I give this heart to this person because you wouldn't know the people also that are on the list. it's not a book. You can't just like, or like a candle that you get gifted and you decide, oh, I didn't buy you a you present, let that. me give it you to you. You can do that with other organs if you obviously match. Really? But with the heart, it's not uh, that easy. Oh, okay. So for instance, if I've got kidney failure and then my dad yeah. decides we're a match, then my dad gives me yes. his kidney. So yeah. that can be done. But yes. with the heart, no. it's something totally different. It's, with the heart, it's very different. It's very hard to get a heart to start with. Mm. So for someone to give you a heart, it would have to be somebody who has decided, you know what, maybe I've, I must just die. Okay, so... Yeah. Um, I mean, 40% drop in, in, in organ donations. Here's a platform. Do you, do you want to say, guys? Because I mean, also, you know, I don't know about mm. white people because I've never been white, but I know with black people, it's like, hi, no, you, you can't go to heaven when you don't have your heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to start with, when you die, your body remains here. Yeah. And it's only your soul that goes wherever you believe. Yes, well, I'm yes. a Christian, yeah. so I believe it goes to either heaven or hell. So... It, it has nothing to do your, uh, with your organs. Your organs are just going to rot. Mm. It's, they're just going to, you know, stay just here. Rot. So it's very important that people don't keep it in their hearts that they are organ donors. Go out there, find the information, sign. I mean, there's even websites. You can just go onto the net and yeah. um, sign in and write your name for organ donation. Okay, so I, have to, I have to leave you guys. This has been so fascinating. Candace, <laughs> please go swim with dolphins. You've been dying to your entire life. Go do it, Dr. Vriam Desi. You Thank are you. an absolute national treasure. Carry on with that. We've reached the end of the discussion, but the conversation continues on our social media pages. All your WhatsApps are coming through. We're going to answer all the questions there. Make sure you're using the hashtag RealTalk on three. I would also like to thank our guests for helping us commemorate the 50th anniversary of the world's first human-to-human -human transplant performed by our on our very own soil by Dr. Christopher Barnard and Hamilton Nike. For myself and the rest of the team, tomorrow we've got Zahara and something Soweto. Make sure that you join us. It's going to be a party. Have a good evening.